Jimmy, it's uh, Jimmy Bills. Uh, I come from a small place in West Lothian called Blackridge. It's a bit nuts, we're all a bit nuts there. Uh, but uh, there's so many things I'm passionate about. And I mean, the top one is talking about Jesus. It, it has to be. You know, he's not just a man in a black book that you read stories about. He's a risen saviour who lives, who still transforms, heals and breaks chains every single day. And my testimony is about that. Uh, my other passion is, is my wife and my family. And my other passion is scooters. Uh, my wife would probably say that scooters is before her. She calls her Jolene. Uh, this is for the older generation, please don't take my man. <laughs> I, uh, I wash and clean my scooter probably more than I do myself. <laughs> don't agree with me. <laughs> no, I do, but I'm not passionate about scooters and I'm in a scooter club and I love it. I'm reliving my youth of having some kind of midlife crisis. <laughs> There's going to be a little bit of a theme tonight and the theme will be vulnerability. Who knows what vulnerability means? Yeah. Yes. Sorry? <laughs> or did you just get saved? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anybody want to give me a kind of explanation about vulnerability? Frightened. Frightened? Okay. Anybody else? Easy Antisocial. Uh, hmm. Vulnerability means putting yourself in a place of weakness. And you know, as I read the Bible, not just my own story of my testimony from, from brokenness and drug addiction and alcohol addiction, every story I see in the Bible is about weak people being vulnerable with a powerful God, and the powerful God moves on weak people. And what happens to the weak person is that person is transformed. Mm -hmm. God responds to vulnerability. Mm -hmm. He doesn't respond to pride. He doesn't respond to arrogance. He responds to human weakness and vulnerability. And when you're vulnerable with God and open and just say, I have nothing here, mm -hmm. God moves powerfully. Okay, I just wanted to start with a little story, okay? It's kind of, not, not the same as my story, but it's about vulnerability. And you might know it, you probably will. It's in Matthew, and it is Matthew 8, verse 1, okay? So Jesus has been teaching, if you know anything about uh, uh, the parables, Jesus taught from Matthew 5 to the end of Matthew 7. Greatest teaching that you will ever hear in your life. So much wisdom that Jesus teaches. And there he comes from a mountain. So he's walking down the mountain. It says that great multitudes followed Jesus. Because it said that no one had ever spoke like this man. He had authority like no one, not even the teachers of their day, I'm paraphrasing, but they were amazed at this man. We've never heard anything like this in our life. We, we just have to follow you and see what's coming next. And see when you start following Jesus, that's what happens every day in your life. That you are, and I mean sometimes life's not great all the time, but he's worth following. Because every single day there's something different that he does mm -hmm. that blows your expectation. So what, he's, what it says here, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, I love that. Whenever you see that word, behold, it says pay attention. Behold. If you were, uh, I started to chuck some baskets through the marketplace and I would shout to people uh, and I, I would shout something so it would grab their attention. And that's what that's saying here. Please listen carefully, Matthew's saying. And it says, and behold a leper. You stop there. So we go to the leper. So Jesus has been teaching thousands of people. To, following him because like, this guy is phenomenal and the next minute a leper 
comes out of nowhere. Now, if you know anything about a leper in those, those days, they were ostracised from society, they weren't allowed to live near anybody, they might have been in a, a leprinized colony, people would spit on them, people would throw stones at them, they would have to shout unclean. If you talk about isolation, rejection, that's what this guy is going through. Mm -hmm. And it says that he worshipped him. Lord, if you are willing, can you make me clean? And Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So you have a story here, an amazing story. And every time I read this, it blows me away. Mm -hmm. Because here you have a man of vulnerability. He's not allowed near anybody. But I kind of imagine, imagine this picture. It doesn't tell us too much about the man's life. But can you just imagine for a second that he has a family. We don't know what age he got leprosy. He might have had a family. He might have been young, woke up one morning and seen a patch in his hand and went, oh right, okay. Next again, another one, another one, another one. Before you know it, he's rejected. He doesn't have a family, he doesn't have friends anymore. He's banished, he's rejected, mm. and he's alone. Or maybe he had a wife and kids, we don't know. But one thing that we know, that this man was in major, major brokenness. Not just physically, mentally, emotionally, every way you could imagine. But what I love about this man is his vulnerability. You imagine a crowd. Now we know what it was like when COVID started. <laughs> You know, we all wore masks. If anybody cough, you'd be like, for the sake, man. It was like something like a Netflix film. You know, I can remember of, of waiting for medication. And there was not even a shop, but it was port cabins. And everybody was terrified. And that was in the first two weeks. And I was like, <coughs> and everybody was kind of partying and freaked out. You can imagine a man with leprosy just appears in the middle of a crowd. They had every right to throw stones at him and spit on him. But what he does before any response is given from anybody else, he kneels. And it says that he worships Jesus because he knows that there's something incredible about this man Jesus. Mm -hmm. Not just his teaching, but something different. And he might have been observing that every single day. He might have been hiding behind bushes, behind trees, seeing this phenom phenomenal guy teach and saying, I just need to be vulnerable and get next to him. Because if I do, I know something will change. And what he does, he comes out of that. And he gets into a state of vulnerability. And what, what, what the response that Jesus does is just, a, it's just beautiful. He touches him. And he makes him clean. Jesus responds to vulnerability. So I never had a good upbringing. Uh, I, I won't go into too much about it. But basically, 18 months old, my father left me and joined the army. He went on in his career and joined the special services. And I was grew up a very, very timid young guy because my mum had, had, had got married again and uh, my stepfather never gave us a good life. Um, I was, we were, me and my older sister were in foster care because of violence and you know just everyday life. Uh, I was terrified every single day um, and, and one thing that always stuck in my mind and that probably damaged me the most was my father was undercover in Northern Ireland at the time and he was told to get back because it was that serious. And I remember waking up in, in, the, in the morning in my grandmother's house and I just smelled this stale drink and I turned down, it was my dad sleeping. And I just started jumping, I'm about four years old and I'm jumping on him and I'm like, dad, dad. And he woke up and he came to and he came down the stairs and me and my older sister were sitting and he says, I will never, ever, ever leave you again. 
He says, I make that promise to you, I will never leave you again and I will take care of you. <coughs> now when you're a young boy and your dad's in the army, he's your hero. He's, he's everything to you. And because of what was happening in my other life, I needed security more than anything. An hour later my dad was gone and about two weeks later I was in care. And that really affected me. The, the people that I was in foster care with, with were just amazing. They were so loving. That's when I fell in love with German shepherds. They had a German shepherd. And I would ask if the German shepherd could sleep in the room uh, just so I would get some kind of protection if anything happened. And I can always remember the social worker coming with my mum. And my mum came to the door and me and my sister came. In fact, I was six because I was in primary one. And the first thing I asked is, will he be there? And she says, things will be different. And I had to get carried into the car physically because I was screaming and kicking. So that, you know, growing up with one dad going, shoo, don't really care. The other dad showing you nothing but terror and fear and violence that we see on a daily basis kind of doesn't set your heart or your mind right for an early start. And I can remember I was about eight, and I knew I was eight because when I stayed in Broxburn, flats were getting started. We used to, uh, the academy was getting built. And I can remember stealing a can of beer. And I went round to the back of the academy and I drank it in a one And I was violently sick. But I felt something different. I felt powerful. I felt like a hero. I felt, wow, I, I can do anything with this if that's how it makes me feel. I, I felt like Superman. So that's what happened. That's how my addiction started. And about the age of 12, I started sniffing solvents. About the age of 13 and 14, I was smoking cannabis on a regular basis. And by 15 onwards, I went to heavier drugs and drink. And all that kept on happening to me was my... Now, listen, sometimes life is not... It's not nice. Things happen mm -hmm. to us caused by other people. But I believe, and I'll stand here, and I wish I would have gave myself that advice when I was younger. I don't need to play a victim. I can live my life differently mm -hmm. by the choices that I made. Mm -hmm. So my choice was this, and my heart was this. You've done that to me, and I'll... I'll, I'll do something bad to myself. So when I left school, I went in my history teacher's class, Mr. McLean, I hope you're watching. <laughs> and I went in and I said, could you sign my leavers form? And he went in front of the whole sixth year and he says, this is Jimmy Bills, I want you to take a good look at him. He will either be in jail or he'll be an addict. And I walked out and I just thought, really? Is that what people think about me? I was insecure enough, you wouldn't have thought it if you met me. I was fully mischief and got myself into quite a lot of trouble. But that's because I was troubled. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if that's what people think of me, stuff everybody. If that's how the world's going to treat me from me being born, stuff everybody. No interest in. So there you go, there's a red button of destruction and I'll press it. And I did. And for a while, uh, I was down this path of drugs and alcohol every single day. Uh, I couldn't go down a job for long. Uh, and I can remember, I always believed in God. My mum would take me to a small evangelical church uh, when I was growing up, so my stepfather. I just thought, that's the most boring thing ever in life. But I, I did believe there was something. And what happened was, I was at a pub one day, and I wasn't even drunk. And, and I mean, I stand and I testify this 100% true. You know, uh, my friends thought I was mad. But I went home, and I walked up my path, three steps to my house. I lived with my friend, because I left the house when I was about 15 and a half. I went with a black bag and said, his mum can stay for the weekend, and I was there for six years. And uh, they were just like another mum and dad to me. And as I was walking up the path, someone appeared to me in white, pure white. 
and he held out his right hand to me and he says, Jimmy, please stop what you're doing three times. Three times. And then I woke up and I was like, nah, nah, that could, no, I must have been really drunk, but no, I only had two times. And I went back to the pub and I was like, and everybody was like, you're acting a bit strange. And I was like, guys, you're like, you're, you're nuts. But this kept on happening in the back of my mind. I was like, wait a minute, something's happening here. This is not a natural thing to happen. But apart from knowing that, I still went on the downward spiral of drugs and alcohol. And in hindsight, when I look back now, it wasn't long after that that I took a, a full breakdown. I had a drug and alcohol induced psychosis. Uh, I thought I was severely mentally ill and I was going to get locked up so I wouldn't tell anybody. So I was hearing voices. It was just horrendous. I didn't want to live. Um, so I, I thought if I tell anybody this, I'll get put away. So I, I, I dealt with that by more drugs and more alcohol. And uh, here, something extraordinary happens. The man that I hate more than anything in my life, he met me at a bus stop. Now, him and my mum had divorced at the time. <laughs> and he got out and he came up to me and it was in Bathgate and I was waiting for a bus and he says, Jimmy, I, I hear that you're broken. I screamed and I shouted at him and I says, you've caused this. You've, you've done this. I says, I'm, I'm a mess because of you and what you've done. He got in his car and he went. Two weeks later, my son was born and he came to my house. He knocked the door and he says, please, Please, can I talk to you? Can I come in? And I went, right, okay. Now, I wanted him to come in because I've seen a bit of a softness in him and he wasn't soft. But I wanted him humiliated. So he sat down and I screamed and I shouted and I swore at him and just said every nasty thing to him. And he cried. Now, those tears changed something in my life from that second because I went, wait a minute. He's never cried. I've never seen that man cry in his life. And here he's crying. And he told me how he found Jesus. And I tried not to laugh. You know, because I was like, yeah, are you okay? But I was like, no, wait a minute. And he says, I want you to come to church. And I went, look, I, I, I didn't need all that nonsense in my life. And he says, look. And he says, I know what I've caused to your life and how I've affected your life. I know a man that can change it. And I was just, this is so cheesy, man. Oh, Jesus, yeah, he changed his life, okay. But I, I, I just turned around, because I just had a son, and something kind of happens when you become a parent, and I went, right, okay, I'll come. And I went to Hart Hill that night, to a little evangelical church that I used to go to, and there was a guy called Danny McVicker. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and, uh, he, he could preach, you know. He was an ex-alcoholic, right wee hard man for Hart Hill. And uh, he, he was preaching, and I turned around to my stepdad and I went, quietly, how dare you tell him about my life? Because when he was speaking, it was like a spotlight was on me. And I'm going, this is all planned. You, you've told him about me, you've told everything, the way I feel, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't know then that it was actually God putting a spotlight on me and saying, Son, I know from the very day that you were born, but now you're meeting me tonight and I'm going to highlight all your pain, all the stuff that needs to be addressed. But all I want you to do is be vulnerable with me. Because I was proud and I was arrogant. I didn't need anybody. Mm -hmm. And when he gave a gospel appeal that night and he says, Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, and I just, I didn't care who was there. And when you're younger, you, you, you want to, you know, a bit of street cred about you and stuff. You don't want to go home and say, by the way, guys, I'm going to church. I didn't care anymore because I was that broken and I was that messed up in my mind. I believe that if I didn't meet God, I would have had nothing there. <coughs> 
So, my vulnerability runs to the front, and I'm like, yes, I, I need to change, I can't stand this anymore, just like that man that you read about it. He's vulnerable, he's like, I can't live like this anymore, I'll push my way to the front, I don't care who's there, but I know that this man can do something. And that night I just worshipped Jesus and I said, right, you've got me. My hand. I was expecting to be whisked away and like <laughs> dust and stuff coming over me, you know, like you see in films and nothing happened. I was like, right, okay. So I go back to my brokenness. I start living in my brokenness. The dark drug, drink, I was just a new dad, I was, I, you know, it was just horrible. And I went to church one day and my pastor was speaking about, I can't really mind what it was, but he was saying that it's not a bad thing to question God and ask God questions because I had this fear of God that, that it was an unhealthy fear. And I was paranoid, you know, I'd go to work and I couldn't drink any juice near anybody. I'd think that people would spite me. That's how messed up I was. And what happened, I go in my bedroom and I says, God, really? No, that's what it was. Somebody gave their testimony in the morning and they're standing up there and they're going, Jesus has set me free. And I'm sitting going, I agree. That's nonsense. If Jesus sets you free, why am I still like this? And I've been at this three weeks or something. And I prayed in my bedroom and what I heard was this. 1 Samuel 1, 14 right through my head and I went here we go same old psychosis anyway it took me quite a while to find this uh, I didn't have internet at the time so I had to get out a bible and this is exactly what 1 Samuel 1 14 says how long will you keep getting drunk put your wine away from you and I thought God wine I'm a massive bucket drinker <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that, that was my, you can't what I'm drinking. So I turned around and I says to God, I tell you what, God, if you're that loving and if you're that real, you have to do something and prove yourself. And that is you take away the desire for drugs and alcohol. Nothing happened again. Nothing magically happened. I didn't feel anything. But by two days, by three days, by four days, by five days, by the end of the week, I'm going, I have not had one craving for anything at all. Wait a minute, there's something in this. And I was just like, this is incredible. I'd go to work and I'd, I'd say to people, what did you do at the weekend? And I would always pick the people that would come back and say, I look wasted. And I'd say, what did you do? Oh, I was steaming drunk and I was rolling a big basket. And I'd go... Please ask me what I've done. I was at church. If you don't believe Jesus, you're going to go to hell. That was my evangelism kind of routine. I, I even asked one boy outside in the car park that says you're a nutter. I tried to submit him into believing in Jesus. But Jesus still had a long way to go in again. But what was happening, this was still happening, although the drugs and the alcohol desire was away, I was still really messed up in my head. I was still really in a dark place. And one day my pastor, Jeff Lees, mm -hmm. very first pastor, he was an amazing guy, ex-army. Mm -hmm. So when I came into church, I needed someone like that because I was used to rejection. So I'd go into the church with a really offensive t-shirt on and nobody would say nothing. It would really make me angry. I'd go, why is nobody saying anything about my t-shirt? So I went back the next day and week with even something more offensive, thinking they'll all tell me to get out, yes, these Christians, or the pastor will go off his head. And all the pastor says to me is, Jimmy, do you mean you really mean that? I just went, no. Because I, I wanted that rejection that I was used to. <laughs> and anyway, he was speaking about the power of Jesus and the name of Jesus and how even the mention of the name of Jesus changes things and how if demons came near Jesus that they would just, they had to go because of his authority and the power in his name. And I was like, that's easy. Really? All we have to do is use the name of Jesus. Now, I was a Christian not very long. I didn't really know the Bible. But one thing I did, <laughs> something was taught to me, was about the power of the name of Jesus. 
And I think we've lost that in the West as a church. We've kind of too timid now. And when you see the churches growing all over the world in persecuted countries, they know how to use the name of Jesus Christ. And there's healings of people delivered constantly and people saved because of that powerful name. Yeah. The name above all other names. And I go in my bedroom and I went on my knees and I went, I command in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whatever is causing this, you have to go. You can't stay here. And all I felt, <laughs> sorry if you've had something to eat, but all I felt was evil. I had felt like all the evil gathered all over my life that I'd been through and done was actually resisting. And I was freaking out. And I shouted on my wife and I went, there's something happening, there's something, I was shaking like a leaf. But I, I couldn't stop. Because I felt it was here and it wanted to come out, if that makes sense. And I kept on going, I was shouting in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you have no right to be here. And all of a sudden, sorry, I was sick all over the carpet. But I was jumping up and down because I felt something happen to me that day, which I cannot describe. I don't think there's any words in the dictionary to describe it. And all I can say was that I was set free. And that was 25 years ago. That was 25 years ago. I've never had any mental health issues. Maybe other people would tell you to. <laughs> My church thinks I'm a bit nutty. But that was it. That was it. I, had not, I would go to work and I would be like, I would force myself to think the way I, would, I used to think. And this might seem strange, but I could open a can of juice and leave it with staff being a bit. I could never do that. I couldn't do that for about five years. I had no crazy thoughts in my head. I could go to sleep. And I just thought, I'll oh, tell you something, Jesus. I will, I don't matter what it takes, I will live the rest of my life for you. And what I heard was, I want you to preach the gospel. I would go like that. And then I would pray, God, what do you want me to do? I want you to preach the gospel. I'd go like that. And then I would go to a church and somebody would say, God, what do you preach the gospel? And I'd be like, no, no, me, I'm thick. I have no O grades. I've, you know, I was dyslexic in English. People think I'm a bit of a wally. Can I say it, Paul? Kevin Pete uh, says it. <laughs> <laughs> so this passion was put in me to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. my, my, my pastor was beside himself because I'd go up to him every single week and I'd say, God's telling me to preach, you'd go, great. I'd go, no, you, you don't listen to me, God's telling me to preach. And I'll tell you the truth, I went away, I bought my new suit and I bought three diaries. So my new suit was for preaching, that diary was for preaching engagements and two other diaries were for sermon notes. I'd only been a Christian for about nine months at that point. And then Jeff says to me, you want to preach as an outreach in Motherwell? And I went, I'm, I'm preaching. And I spent about three weeks putting this sermon together. It was about 30 pages. And uh, I got up with my new suit. And I, my legs were knocking at the back of the pulpit. And I must have said my sermon in 45 seconds. And I was that embarrassed that I walked out. And I can always remember, I went right round to the back of the building, I lit up a cigarette, I went on my knees, and I shouted to God, you called me to preach, you're humiliating me. <laughs> then my pastor walked round, but I even, I just couldn't stop laughing. I didn't understand that God had still quite a number of years to build my character. But then after that, I, I got the call to Bible College, that was quite a number of years after. And as I was just graduating Bible college, my marriage went. And I thought, God, no. You're just like a dad. You get so far, then you go, ah, see? And it took me probably about six months for my trust to get back in God. But John Henson, who's just the most incredible pastor I've ever had, he just told me, hey, God can never ever break a promise. He can never break a covenant. 
And what he told me is remain integral. Remain integral to God. And I did. And I never ever thought I'd be in ministry because of that. And I mean, that was nothing of my doing. But then God is still faithful. He's faithful. I've been in ministry 11 years now. It's tough. Uh, I'm only 22. <laughs> uh, uh, but my passion is to tell people about Jesus. And that's, that's all it is. You know. And what I want to say tonight, and, and the theme here is vulnerability. I don't know who you are. I know David and I know Elaine. I know this gentleman here in the suit. I've seen you quite a times before. But I don't know anybody else. I don't know if you're a Christian. I don't know your position in life, where you're standing just now. But what I will say is if you're vulnerable towards Jesus, Jesus responds powerfully. He does. I know that from my life. I know that from, you know, I, I most people that come to your church, we're not a large church in Bathgate. We've got another church in Armadale that will be starting again. But most people that come to Encounter Church have been through such brokenness. And I, I, I praise God for that. Mm -hmm. Because when you see brokenness come through the door, you get excited because you're like, oh. <laughs> see them there vulnerable with Jesus, you watch this transformation. And the testimonies in the church were not big. But the, the, the testimonies of what Jesus has done because yeah. people have been vulnerable in front of them have been just mind-blowing. And what I want to say tonight is please be vulnerable with your Saviour. If you don't know him tonight, be vulnerable with Jesus mm -hmm. because he responds powerfully. I'm only one story among billions. And that's the beauty of Jesus Christ still touching lives today, mm -hmm. is that it still goes on and it still mm -hmm. goes on. And it's not just a story of mine, it's personal. It's not following a religion or going, here's a story, it's personal. I feel him, I feel his spirit. Supernatural things have happened to me because he's a supernatural saviour that still heals the lovers and set people free. You might be in addiction tonight, you might have be struggling with mental health, you might not know Jesus tonight, but I pray and I, with every bit of my heart, my desire is for you to be vulnerable with Jesus tonight. And in that, he responds on your life powerfully. Can we pray? Mm -hmm. yeah. Lord Jesus, you're here. For two or three are gathered, you're here. And Jesus, our heart is that you are glorified. That people walk out of here tonight having met you. Not just heard about you, but met you personally through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Jesus, I pray tonight, Lord, that you would move across this room. And Lord, our response would be one of vulnerability. And if you're struggling tonight with anything, please be vulnerable with your Saviour if you know him. Be real with him. Be open with him. Respond in vulnerability and weakness with him. He's stronger than you. He's stronger than us all. And I tell you, if you don't know Jesus tonight, I don't know if you do or not. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus went to a cross. He suffered horrific pain mm -hmm. and torture for you. And there's one thing that divides us, like that song said about the, the blood is that it's sin, it's something called sin. And the, we all fall short of God because of sin. Mm. And it also says that the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. Jesus 
loves you so much that he died for you. For God so loved the world that he died, that he gave his only son to die for you. He died to cover your sin. He died to give you a hope. It says that Jesus said one statement that's the most incredible statement of heaven. It says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. That Jesus would come down from heaven, suffer all that to give us an abundant life? Absolutely, yes. A better life than you've ever, ever led. So I pray tonight, if you do not know Jesus, that you know him tonight, that you respond back to him. And what he requires is you to have faith in him, to believe in him and to confess. Jesus Christ, yes, you are Lord. And I believe that you died and rose again for me, that you took my sin upon the cross. And Lord, please fill me with your spirit and I ask for forgiveness for the way I've lived. And now my vulnerability will cause me to live for you. And if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ tonight, I will have to do one thing before I go home. I have to ask you, if you've not, can you let me know? I'm not here to embarrass you, but I'm here to tell you about the greatest man who lived and who will ever keep on living. So if you, for the first time, have said yes to Jesus tonight, can you let me know by putting up your hand?